and welcome back. We're very happy that everybody has come back from lunch and able to join us for this afternoon session. We have quite a robust one of good presentations. I'm going to turn over the afternoon to my colleague, Dr. Randall Bateman. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mims. Um, uh, we're going to get started with, I'm going to do some opening remarks on our plans for the presentation this afternoon. We do have some exciting presentations on advancements in research. NAPA has four subcommittees. One is the research subcommittee, which I chair. And uh, we have a lot of great news to report, advancements which are occurring in the research arena that are making a difference uh, now, even for patients and families in the clinic. And so we're going to, uh, if I, we could put up my slides, please, on the opening remarks. Go ahead and start. Okay, great. So I'm going to review uh, a little bit of, about where research overall is at and what research means uh, for uh, our communities. I'm an investigator at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my research focuses on Alzheimer's disease and patients and research participants who, who do that research. And on the next slide, you can see that uh, we have a lot of research across various groups and institutions, from public funds to uh, industry that generates, um, uh, develops treatments and uh, others. And all of this comes together to mean changes for patients and their families. We go to the next slide. The changes that uh, people, patients typically talk about in the clinics and their families talk about are typically in one of several categories. One is treatments, another is diagnostic tests, and a third is support and care and services. How do they get the help that they need? In terms of treatments, Dr. Hodes already reviewed the advancements that have recently been made in treatments that have been approved by the FDA and covered by CMS now. And so we're in an era where we're treating Alzheimer's disease and effectively changing the course of it for the first time in history in the clinics uh, for our patients. And that's quite remarkable because for thousands of years, dementia was recognized as a major problem, but we couldn't really change the course of the disease. And I just wanna highlight that that uh, reality is here today because of research. It's research that changes the cookbook of medicine, how we practice, and what we can do for patients and families. And so the research and the investments that have been made over the past years, decades really, uh, a major support through the National Institutes of Health have led to these advancements in terms of understanding the disease, understanding how it starts and progresses, and figuring out ways to intervene in it. And so it's already paying off uh, it's yielding what its intended use is. There are several treatments now that are either available or considering or about to become available potentially, and many more that are coming on the way. And so as our advancing understanding uh, increases, our ability to intervene increases as well. The second area that research has had positive yields in is in diagnostic testing. And also reviewed by Dr. Hodes was the uh, diagnostic testing that's developed over the past uh, 10 or dozen years or so is really advanced from initially use, requiring a spinal tap and being uncertain about what those results mean in terms of predictability to today, we have three classes of diagnostic tests, including spinal taps, PET scans, which are use tracers to detect the pathologies of Alzheimer's disease, and now blood tests, which measure the same proteins that are present in the cerebrospinal fluid from spinal taps. These tests have reached a level of precision and understanding to where we can have approximately 95% accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease amyloid plaques. And that turns out to be quite important, both for treatment, but also for accurate uh, diagnosis and prediction. 
And then finally, the, um, the prevention side of things has really grown in understanding, and that was also reviewed by Dr. Hodes, um, and our ability to try to prevent people from getting the disease before they have it, and that's a major initiative. This morning's discussion on uh, uh, services and what's being implemented in the community is quite important because this uh, matters for people who have the disease and having the support they need. Next slide. So I want to just talk briefly a bit about um, these advancements and what made them possible. I mentioned that the National Institutes of Health is a major funder of biomedical research has laid the foundation, the groundwork for many of these advancements to occur. I don't believe they would have occurred without NIH funds. The uh, acts that were discussed this morning in terms of uh, mandating a review and a plan to address Alzheimer's disease and a professional budget being provided, I think have been instrumental in increasing the ability of what we can do. I also believe that now is the time not to back off. We are at the edge, at the verge of a precipice of our ability to make a change to make differences for patients. We have the first generation of, of treatments and tests that are now available. We can do so much more and do better if we continue to apply our efforts in biomedical research. We can develop better treatments. We can make tests even more informative and more predictive. And through research and care and services and other things, we can provide better care for people. So in my perspective, as someone who sees patients and families in my clinic and actively does research, clinical research, I believe the most important thing is that uh, the budgets uh, um, support the kinds of research that are happening. Uh, shown here is that uh, last year, for example, Congress increased the budget for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias by $226 million. And as was shown before, that puts the total at about $3.7 billion. The NIH is currently funding a huge number of clinical trials that have the potential to make a difference in prevention, treatment, and caregiving, including over 170 that are non-pharmacologic. You go to the next slide, however, there's a huge amount that still has to be done. Uh, shown on this slide, there are research to an answer outstanding questions, and we'll be reviewing these later this afternoon, on how to use these disease-modifying treatments. How can we implement them to have the largest impact? And who can they help, and how much can they help? To develop and test additional drug candidates in more representative, efficient, and practical clinical trials are needed so that we can deliver on the promise of treatment, not just for a select group of people, but for everyone. I mentioned better biomarkers and treatments, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for related dementias. And we're going to talk specifically this afternoon about other dementias and what they mean to people and what, where the research is at. We need to increase our knowledge of the risk and the protective factors in individuals and across diverse populations. And in particular, we're going to, uh, I'm going to recommend that we focus on those things. For example, this morning it was discussed, ARIA is a risk factor for treatment uh, when people have these disease-modifying treatments occur. Another area of research is to pursue precision medicine so that we can detect the diseases earlier and tailor treatment plans to an individual's unique disease and risk profiles. And finally, to leverage emerging, to emerging digital technologies and big data to speed discoveries will be needed to inform future work. On the next slide, you can see that uh, here is is an example of what happens, for example, when the budget uh, is in continuing resolution. So the NIA funding lines uh, were for fiscal year 2023 with the normal budget at an AD, ADRD pay line of 25% for all investigators. In continuing resolution, because the agency has to be conservative because they don't have a full budget allocated yet, when researchers apply to grants to do the research, those pay lines 
precipitously drop their half or less. And so you can see a 12% pay line for less than $5 million grants and 10% pay line. That means out of 10 applications received by 10 different research teams that have worked hard to put together a meritorious application, only one out of 10 are being funded under the current continuing resolution. That is cutting into the meat, cutting into the bone. I don't think that's a good thing. So uh, I think the message is there are consequences to not having a full approved budget and for increasing the budget so that the research can continue at the current rate to have the benefits that have already been realized. And so on the last slide, uh, just a couple more points on this. Um, the uh, science is here. The people who can change and do the work are there. The government agencies to help implement these changes are there. And so now what's really needed is that the, um, the leaders, the political leaders uh, need to uh, come forward with a budget that's appropriate for this problem to continue the advancements and make a difference. And uh, that I think will, will make a huge difference as we move forward just in the next few years. I predict there will be multiple breakthroughs which will occur, which will continue to accelerate and change how we diagnose, manage, and treat Alzheimer's disease, and that this will make a world of difference for those people who have to live with these diseases. Okay. Okay. So uh, Dr. Mims wants, wants me to discuss this particular point. Many researchers who submitted grants that were in the fundable range in fiscal year 2023 needed to revise and submit their applications, leading to countless additional hours spent preparing applications, time that could have been spent conducting research, and significant delays in research funding. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit because uh, at one point I had an application personally, our team did, for a clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease that we just reported uh, demonstrated some of the first evidence of we might be able to actually prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease by treating people many years on, in this case, in our trial, eight years before symptom onset, that there might be the potential to do that. Uh, but because the funds were so limited uh, at the time, we had to rewrite the entire application, submit it again, and that's a process that takes about six to nine months. Uh, so things get delayed by that time period. And what it means is that the discoveries that we make, the things we find out, if we have to reapply, or in, in that case, it's delayed, but sometimes it may not be funded. And so it is possible to miss discoveries. There's, a, there's lots of examples of this. One of them in medicine is that... Um, the statins were almost not developed to lower cholesterol to prevent heart disease. And uh, because of uh, a variety of concerns and events occurred, but had that not continued, it is very possible uh, to miss discoveries. It's not a given that scientific discoveries will just come unless you invest in them. And so it's, uh, the, I, I think the message here for everyone who doesn't do this, I think, we're all here. I'm preaching to the choir in this room. You all do research. You all do healthcare delivery, and and we all do this. So we all know full well what it takes to get this done. My message today is is not to those of us who are in this room, and and the ones who are doing the work. It's to the people who don't have the benefit of doing that work, uh, realizing what the impact of their actions are, and so that if we can. I want to just send the message clearly that if, the, if you give us the opportunity, if you give the resources, we can change the course of the disease. Okay. With that, I'm going to switch over, and we're going to uh, have Dr. Eric Musiak uh, present on treating Alzheimer's disease with lecanemab, and this is uh, the case example that I was referring to, uh, which is where we're now treating patients in the clinic for the first time, removing amyloid plaques out of their brains, 
and um, changing the course of their disease for the first time. And this is our first real uh, broad clinical effort in trying to do this. And so anytime you, you change how you treat the disease completely, uh, there are real challenges. And so Eric has led uh, the efforts at Washington University with a group of others, and how do you deliver treatment, and what are the challenges, and what are the opportunities, and what are some of the remaining uh, questions and issues to address? So, Eric? Great. Th thanks, Randy. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, like Dr. Bateman, I'm also a researcher. I work on sleep and Alzheimer's disease and circadian rhythms, and I have a large grant going in as a revision uh, later this week. So I, I echo his sentiments about hoping for uh, uh, approval of the budget. Uh, but today I'm wearing my, my clinical hat uh, as a neurologist. Uh, like Dr. Bateman, I also treat patients with Alzheimer's in our clinic, which at, here at Washington University we call our Memory Diagnostic Center, uh, the clinic focused on memory disorders and Alzheimer's disease. And we have, I think, are a bit ahead of the curve in, in uh, using this new drug, lecanemab, which was recently approved um, to treat early stage Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's. And so I wanted to sort of give you an overview of what, what this looks like in real life uh, for patients and for, uh, for providers like myself and Dr. Bateman and others, uh, and some of the challenges that exist and some of the opportunities um, potentially that research can, can help us. Uh, help patients even more effectively. Uh, we, we kind of use this drug as a first step in the right direction, but certainly not uh, the end of the game. And, and you'll see from the data why that's the case. Uh, so next slide, please. So just so you understand, this drug uh, uh, attacks these amyloid plaques, which are one of the first forms of pathology that we see in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And I've kind of co-opted this figure from many researchers, including uh, Cliff Jack, uh, who sort of uh, popularized these curves, showing that amyloid, uh, you know, Dr. Bateman and others have shown that it accumulates in the brain probably 10 to 20 years prior to the onset of clinical symptoms, which I've drawn with this dotted line here. Uh, and so when we see patients in the clinic, it's important to understand this plaque pathology has already been there uh, probably for at least a decade. Uh, we're, we're seeing patients, if we're lucky, here, where they're just starting to get mild symptoms. And what we want to do is identify them here because we're attacking this amyloid pathology. Our hopes is that we'll still get some clinical um, bandwidth there. But if we don't see the patients until they get in later or, or we don't treat them until later, at that point, probably this other uh, pathology, tau pathology, is probably already sort of maximalized. Neurodegeneration is already severe, and the drug's very unlikely to help. Um, so it's the, you know, there's been a lot, an argument in the field for years that we need to move this arrow more towards the left, uh, the first arrow, that the earlier we can treat patients, the better. Um, but when we're waiting for them to have symptoma, symptomatology, we're really treating a pathology that's probably been there um, for several, uh, even decades. So, so that's uh, kind of a framework of what we're doing. That we, these new drugs uh, can remove these plaques uh, and we need to do that kind of as quickly as we can in these patients. And there's a relatively small window in which to do that. And that creates a lot of the challenge uh, of identifying these patients early and getting them on this drug as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's just showing the amyloid probably leads kind of as an instigator of this pathology. So lecanemab uh, is the first fully FDA-approved drug that we know can remove these amyloid plaques. Aducanemab received partial uh, approval from the FDA, but never really took off um, clinically. But lecanemab is now fully FDA-approved um, because of this trial, uh, which Dr. Bateman was uh, deeply involved with, the Clarity AD trial, which um, treated patients that had either very mild uh, Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment thought to be due to Alzheimer's disease, um, for 18 months with this drug, which can remove these amyloid plaques, these patients, as I mentioned, they had a clinical dementia rating of 0 0.5 or 1, which is mild, mild impairment. Um, and the drug showed that it was able to remove plaques very effectively. So that's what this upper graph is showing, that amyloid PET scans uh, showed an almost uh, complete removal of plaques in some patients, or at least a, a very strong removal of amyloid pathology in the brain um, within the 18-month period of treatment. And that patients, um, when they met all these criteria, and there's even more criteria than this, uh, showed some slowing of cognitive decline. So uh, the primary endpoint of the study was the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes, 
which is a holistic measurement of clinical uh, performance. It's not just a cognitive test. It takes into account memory, judgment, and problem-solving orientation, home and hobbies, um, their ability to conduct their daily uh, activities of daily living. So it's a holistic scale. And it showed that people that were treated with the drug over the first 18 months of the treatment uh, period uh, did show a 20%, 27% slowing of their cognitive decline. So this met the primary endpoint. Uh, obviously, this is not completely stopping the disease. There's still decline. Uh, it's not turning back the clock. And this is an important thing for patients to understand. It does not make them better, uh, but it potentially slows the course of the disease by a meaningful amount. We, we believe a, a meaningful amount, although that's still an argument uh, that, that's being uh, thrown about. So lecanemab, this is the data. Uh, we have this one big trial with lecanemab, uh, and now it's approved. Um, uh, next slide. So it, it was approved in July of 2023 for full approval by the FDA, and then CMS uh, came forward with Medicare approval very shortly thereafter. So this drug suddenly was available to us. Fortunately, at, at Wash U in St. Louis, we had already been preparing for this for some time. We'd actually been preparing for aducanemab, um, and so we had some things in place uh, that allowed us to start treating patients fairly quickly after this approval occurred. Uh, next slide, please. So this sounds great, but there are some downsides to this drug, and I'll get into them a bit. As, other than the cost and the inconvenience of the drug, there is this ARIA that was mentioned by Dr. Bateman, uh, amyloid-related imaging abnormality, uh, which essentially is an inflammatory response to amyloid plaques in the blood vessels, uh, or cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It uh, comes in two forms, ARIA-E, which is uh, edema that occurs usually around blood vessels and can look like this on MRI, or ARIA-H, which are microhemorrhages, these little black dots, which indicate uh, a tiny amount of blood extravasation around the blood vessels. And so um, these are generally, they're, they're called imaging abnormalities because they're seen on MRI. So they're generally asymptomatic. So I, I showed some of the data here. Um, among all comers, ARIA-E and ARIA-H, about 21% of people in the trial actually developed ARIA-E or ARIA-H during the trial. But it's worth noting that 9.5% of the patients on placebo also developed ARIA and primary ARIA-H. So a lot of patients with Alzheimer's disease already have ARIA-H and it gets worse as the disease goes on. So this increased the risk of ARIA on MRI by about 10%, 11%. Um, Symptomatic aria, only about 2.8% of patients had symptoms related to this, and those can range anywhere from dizziness and headache to more severe uh, bleeding in a few cases. Um, so the vast majority of these are just seen on MRI and require a dose adjustment or holding a dose or potentially stopping the drug, but most patients don't have any symptoms. However, patients who are homozygous for the APOE4 gene, you can see uh, they had a 32.6% uh, risk of having aria and over 9% of those patients were symptomatic. So APOE4 is thought to be a, a risk factor for ARIA that has a pretty substantial impact. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we decide who to give this drug to? It seems very complex. There's these issues of ARIA, there's a APOE considerations, they have to meet certain clinical clin cr criteria. So we don't know yet, uh, you know, and so, and so what we have done and what I think what most groups have done in, in the, the uh, all the um, best use criteria that have come forth are essentially using the criteria that were used in the trial. And this is probably the safest approach, but maybe not entirely proven to be the best approach yet. Um, and so what we do in our clinic is we treat people very similarly to those that were enrolled in the trial, because those are the people we have data for. Um, so mild asymptomatic AD, a clinical dementia rate of 0 0.5 is preferable. That's very mild. Um, MMSE above 22, so the mini mental status test is out of 30. A 22 is a pretty good score. Um, we do have some leeway on that. Individual uh, in, uh, physicians may grant some leeway on that for patients that have uh, language problems or other issues that might affect their MMSE. They must have biomarkers. So the FDA doesn't say which biomarker, nor does CMS. So we use all three in our center. We uh, have CSF biomarkers, tau, A beta ratio. We have amyloid PET. Uh, and we have plasma biomarkers, such as the pre 82 test. And so we are still, as a group, I think, deciding uh, which are the best of these. Uh, and in some cases, it depends on which the patient can, can get or afford. 
um, they have to have MRI. So a patient must have a, an MRI within a year, and they can't have more than four microhemorrhages on their MRI. They can't have super siderosis. Superficial siderosis is blood in the brain, essentially, uh, or other lesions. They have to be able to get MRIs. So if you can't get MRIs at this point, we, you know, it's very difficult, although we don't know that the, you know, maybe CT could, could serve this purpose. So that's an area we need to investigate further. Um, you know, obviously people that are very sick with other issues were excluded from the trial. And so we generally avoid patients with renal failure, or cirrhosis or severe heart failure on chemotherapy, et cetera. And then two sort of um, important factors are the APOE4 genotype. I, I mentioned that homozygous APOE4 carriers have higher risk of, of AD. Uh, some of the other uh, groups suggest that you shouldn't treat these patients at all. Uh, at our center, uh, we kind of leave it to the discretion of the physician um, with the understanding that the patients would need to really understand the risks and benefits here and that they are at higher risk. Um, these patients also probably need the drug the most because they have the most severe disease in most cases. Uh, anticoagulation. So there are a few individual case studies where patients had bleeding uh, that were on anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation or other things uh, when they were treated with lecanemab. However, if you look at the actual data from the New England Journal paper, there's no in indication that in anticoagulation increases risk of aria. And in fact, the aria numbers look slightly lower in patients on anticoagulation. So at our center, we again leave this at the discretion of the physician, but it requires a discussion of risk benefit. And, and this drug has a lot of discussion of risk benefit. Um, you know, these are the best practices we have now, but each of these criteria need to be considered with like really firm research to see if they're actually accurate or if there's better criteria we can use. And most patients don't meet these criteria. They're very difficult to meet these, all, all these criteria. Maybe 25% of our patients that come in the door actually end up needing them. So it's not every patient that's going to be getting this. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to walk through a quick the journey of a patient with lecanemab, what it looks like, how, what they experience. So they're first referred to our clinic. They see one of our neurologists, myself or Dr. Bateman or several others. I think there's eight or nine of us now, um, you know, referred by their primary care doctor. They have a one-hour visit with us. We spend a lot of time talking to a collateral source, so a family member, spouse, someone that knows them well. And actually, the clinical dementia rating score is based on the collateral source's opinion of the patient, not necessarily the, the patient's opinion of themselves. They also get psychometric tests, including the mini mental status test and others. We review all of their medical history, whatever imaging they have, and we give them a clinical dementia rating in the clinic that day to, to see if they're uh, eligible from a clinical standpoint for this drug. And then if so, if they seem like a good candidate, we actually start to initiate a discussion of biomarkers and tell them a bit about lecanemab. Um, and 100% of the people get this. Uh, next slide, please. So about 90% uh, of them, we think, okay, there actually is a, something worth investigating. They get a brain MRI. They get some basic labs to rule out other problems. And these things, if they don't show any disqualifying characteristics, then we go on to the next. Um, next slide, please. And which would be biomarker testing. So then we discuss with them, well, do you want to know, you know, is this Alzheimer's disease and potentially move forward on this pathway? We offer them any of these three options for biomarker testing. There's some complexities there. pre 82 is not covered by insurance yet. Amyloid PET is covered, but it's still a little difficult to get. I have a peer-to-peer -peer with an insurance company about it after I give this talk. Um, and then we need to get APOE genotyping on patients before we treat them. Um, at least we feel more comfortable knowing if they're APOE 4 4, so we can build that into part of our risk assessment. That's also not covered by insurance. And actually, we've been using, I've been using a, an online do-it-yourself kid at home to get this done. So there's still a lot of pieces here that are kind of uh, moving parts. Um, next slide, please. So if they make it through that, about 25% of the total patients that we started with get to the point where they have amyloid and they meet all the criteria. So then we start talking about lecanemab and usually this requires, we now have a clinic for this. So a patient can come back and have a sit down or we can do it by phone or Zoom, you know, to really tell, do they have realistic expectations of the drug? Do they know it's not gonna cure them? Um, do they have realistic uh, view of the side effects, you know, the risk of aria, what this could mean to them? And do they have a realistic understanding of the impact on their lifestyle? So they have to get an infusion every two weeks. They have to get three MRIs. If they have ARIA, it can be more than three MRIs. This can put a real crimp in your lifestyle. And so there's some people that say, hey, I don't want to deal with this. I want to go to Florida. I want to go travel Europe. I don't want to be getting infusions every two weeks. And so that's a, a big consideration for patients and an important thing for them to understand before they start. 
about 15 to 20 percent of these of the total group end up wanting to proceed and then there's a registry that we complete um, we have to order the drug there's a pre-certification process that our office staff does and then somebody has to set up these infusions and get the mris done at the right time so the mris have to be done after the fifth seventh and thirteenth infusion and they need to be read by a properly certified neuroradiologist that knows what they're looking at before we go on so it's a very complex scheme uh, and then finally, they, we actually have a clinic to help us. We now hired several people to, to help manage all of this. Uh, and then they'll get their MRIs and their follow-up after that. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a picture of how this actually works with the lines going, you know, this is a best case scenario how it works. So it's, it's pretty complex, a lot of moving parts. Very difficult for a non-memory uh, center to do this. I think a general neurologist or someone else would be very, very difficult. Um, next slide. So there's a lot of requirements for the clinic. So you have to have people that know how to diagnose dementia. So we all do the clinical dementia rating for our research purposes here at WashU, but not everyone does that or knows how to do it. And you need a whole staff of people. You need MRI machines. You need neuroradiologists that know how to look for ARIA very well and you can trust. You need biomarker capabilities. You have to be able to do lumbar punctures. You have to know how to evaluate the, the results of these biomarkers, which are not entirely black and white a lot of times. Um, you need support staff to coordinate the infusions, schedule the MRIs, and make sure something doesn't fall through the cracks, that someone that has ARIA doesn't end up getting another infusion, you know, because bad things could happen if this isn't done properly. Um, and you have to have infusion centers at this point. Now, that may be changing. Uh, lacanumab, there's a self-administered version of lacanumab that's currently being evaluated by the FDA that could take the infusion center part out of this but all the rest would stay the same. So it's very work intensive uh, and requires a, a big team, which is like I said, gonna make it very difficult to kind of implement this you know, everywhere in the US. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a diagram made by my colleague, Suzanne Schindler. I forgot to put her name on, on, <laughs> on it, but she made this really interesting diagram which shows how at our center, how things kind of bloom in terms of the number of patients. So each one of these is a patient and each, as you go from left to right, that's each infusion that they've gotten. So, you know, we have some patients that started back in July, in, in September who have, you know, gotten maybe their 13th infusion already, but the number of infusions just grows exponentially. So you can imagine you have to have a lot of, if, if these patients all get, keep getting treated forever every two weeks, the infusion capacity will just expand inf infinitely. So that can't happen. <laughs> so no one can, can do that. Uh, you know, we, we had a backlog of patients that we had already pre-selected for this drug that, you know, we're sort of waiting for it. So there is a lot of a bolus of people, but um, ultimately we need to decide how long these pe people are going to be treated. And, you know, it may not be feasible to treat everyone every two weeks for the rest of their lives, um, you know, within the confines of, of reality. Uh, next slide. I'll kind of finish up here. So there's a lot of challenges for patients. Um, access to our clinic is difficult. We have an eight-month waiting list, and we're you know working as fast as we can. Access to the infusion centers, to the MRI. If you live in a rural area, if you live in a different state, it's difficult. Like we we don't have you know ability to to prescribe infusions necessarily everywhere. You know I, I'm running into this a lot. Insurance, obviously. Uh, Medicare has been fantastic about this, but if patients don't have Medicare, if they're younger than 65, uh, it can be very difficult actually to get this covered. Uh, and it only, you know, Medicare covers 80%. It's very expensive. It'd be $50,000 a year. This could still leave people with a $10,000 bill out of pocket, which is pretty substantial. Uh, and then another issue clinically is differentiating the symptoms of ARIA. They're vague. You know, patients, every patient who has a headache or feels dizzy calls our clinic that's on this drug, it's gonna be a huge clinical demand. And then the last slide, please. So there's a lot of unanswered clinical questions. I, to me, the most important one, how long do we treat these patients? Now that we've started this, how do we end it? You know, is it 18 months? Uh, Donanumab, which is probably soon to be released, has a clear end point, which where after you've cleared the plaques, you stop the drug, but Locanumab does not have this. So I think, because of the issue that I mentioned where the number of infusions just expands exponentially, we really need to know like, when do we stop the drug? When, it, when does it work? You know, how effective is it to stop the drug? Um, and do we need biomarkers to demonstrate that we've cleared the plaques or they're coming back? 
um, can, how plastic is this treatment schedule? So patients, they miss treatments. They go on vacation, they get you know, hospitalized with a broken hip, whatever happens to them, they may not miss some. So how, how plastic is that? You know, what, what if they're missing them? Um, and the problem of snowbirds, I say. So people that wanna to go to Florida or they wanna to go to California or Arizona or someplace else, how do we keep treating those patients? Uh, it's very, very difficult and work intensive at this point. You know, understanding safety for anticoagulated patients and E4 homozygotes and the registries. So we have to fill out these registries with the CMS, which is actually a pretty mon modest amount of work at this point, fortunately. Um, but how helpful can they be? Can they, there are more complex registries like uh, um, there's one through the Alzheimer's Association. Um, you know, how are these going to be leveraged? You know, I think there's a lot of important questions they can answer, but, but, but exactly how is that going to be available to researchers? And I think Randy will talk more about some of the other research questions going forward. So uh, thank you. Hey, fantastic. Thank you. And I, and I will take off where uh, Dr. Music left off on the questions. Um, and I'm just going to try to put it in the context of uh, the research enterprise in general and, and how is it that we answer these kinds of questions. And as with all new treatments, when new things come out, whether it's chemotherapy or statins or penicillin, there are going to be questions that are, that are not answered when you start and you answer them as you move forward, as you treat people. Uh, it's, you know, one could say, well, why not just answer all the questions first and then start? Uh, we would never get started, right? We would never treat anybody with anything if that were the strategy. So we help where we can, and we learn along the way, and we do research to answer these critical questions that are now outstanding and that we have to answer in the field. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, it, it takes a village, or a, in this case, it actually takes the whole world to develop uh, these kinds of treatments and tests. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's start with the who. Who would benefit from treatment with these kinds of drugs? I want to make a point about the clinical trial designs and the current recommended guidelines. All we know is what our clinical trials tell us. And the clinical trials are not designed to answer all questions in everyone. They are designed to answer usually a singular question, the primary outcome. Does the treatment have a benefit over not using the treatment? That question has been answered. These drugs have a benefit in the population that's enrolled above people who did not get the treatment, the placebo. But there are many questions we have about who will benefit and what magnitude of benefit they will receive. We already have some new information coming out about this. For example, at recent uh, Alzheimer's meetings, we've learned that both uh, uh, lecanemab and denanemab have data that indicates the earlier we treat people with these amyloid-removing drugs, the larger their benefit that they receive. So what we saw was an average of a whole spectrum of ranges from very mild through mild, which is a range of about three years of progression in the disease. But it turns out people who by biomarkers or by clinical stage or earlier in their disease process actually have a larger magnitude of benefit than people who are at the later ends of the mile. So even within that window, there's a, there's a differential effect that seems to be occurring in terms of benefit. So that's what we call stage of disease. Similarly, there are questions about potential differences in magnitude of benefit that are being seen. For example, men versus women. Uh, Dr. Music covered ABOE homozygous. So those people have the highest risk of ARIA. Do they have the same level of benefit even accounting for that higher risk of aria? Racial and ethnic minority groups were not broadly and well represented in all categories in these trials, so we have questions about that. People with mixed pathologies. We currently don't have great ways of tracking those pathologies, so we need to understand that. Dr. Koroshetz covered the call for a clinical study that will try to answer that question about 
some of the mixed pathologies. People with a variety of comorbid diseases and conditions. So for example, people who have risk factors of aria or other risk factors, other medical diseases. In general, the clinical trials enroll people who can give the clearest answer to what is the benefit of the drug or the treatment. It doesn't answer what about all the medical comorbidities and what the interactions of complex sets of those are. Even though some data is in there, it's not designed to answer all conditions for all cases. And, uh, and finally, uh, what about the people who would otherwise qualify by criteria but were excluded for other reasons? For example, people with Down syndrome, people with very early age onset Alzheimer's disease under the age of 55, so 45 or 50, people with mutations. These are questions for those groups of people that we still have to address definitively. Next slide. So this is meant to cover some of the, the things that I, I think this is well covered by Dr. Music, so I'm not going to belabor it. But with any treatment, there's always a balance between benefit and risk. And the clinical trial outcome measures in general take into account both benefit and risk. So when the trial is positive, it's meant to be, it's positive for the benefit relative to the risk. Both are included in that calculus but we still have to be cognizant and aware that there are subgroups of people, for example, the APOE4 homozygous people, the people at highest risk for side effects, where we need to understand better what is their long-term risk and what does it mean? Those people also have the highest risk of Alzheimer's disease in general. And so if they will benefit, um, we need to try to make sure we understand what that benefit is and ensure that they have access to treatments as well. Uh, I'm going to uh, make a side note here, which is that um, in medicine, one of the ways that we decide who to offer treatment to is based on guidelines. And there have been guidelines written about the, these forms of treatments. And in large part, those guidelines are written based off what we know, which is the criteria for the clinical trials. But for example, one of the risk factors, microhemorrhages in the brain, can indicate that they're, the amyloid is has deposited inside the blood vessels. That indicates that the risk of aria is higher. The number of microhemorrhages was arbitrarily defined as more than four, meaning five or above microhemorrhages, you were not included in the trial. We have no idea if people with five microhemorrhages would benefit, or seven, or 10, or 12. So when guidelines come out that this drug should be used only in people with four or fewer microhemorrhages, it does not mean that people with five microhemorrhages won't benefit. It means we don't know. And this is the unanswered question that we still have to answer because there are people out there with five and seven microhemorrhages. And that's one of our areas of research. Next slide. So how do we optimize the benefits? How do we know that the dose that we're using, how do we know, uh, as Dr. Music said, how do we know how long to treat for? How do we know what stage of disease and, and disease progression while they're on treatment? How do we make these decisions? And all of that has to be answered again through research. We have to determine, is the same dose just as effective for everybody? Or do some people need higher doses or lower doses? Is the duration of treatment, is it 18 months, the duration of the first part of the trial. Now, the trial's in extension. It's heading out to 36 months, and we'll learn more just from the extension on that trial of duration of treatment, as well as starting earlier versus starting later, and what are the effects of that. Um, how do we use biomarker testing? Can biomarkers help answer these questions? For example, can we use a biomarker to say when we can safely stop treatment without any loss of efficacy. Can a biomarker tell us when we can do that? And people are hot on the search right now. Do we have biomarkers that can predict who's going to get ARIA and who won't? Or predict when someone's going to get ARIA before they get it uh, so that we can save all these MRI scans that are burdensome for the medical system and the patients. 
What about people who've participated in clinical trials and then are prescribed those in the clinic? So what if you're in a trial, you get one drug, and then you go to the clinic and you get a, the same drug or a different drug? What about those people? And if, as there are more drugs on the market, what about switching medications to drug A and then drug B or drug B then drug A? Or, or should we not mix two drugs in the same person at different times? These are questions that we'll have to resolve. Uh, as, as uh, clinical experience grows in this area. Next slide. So how do we implement it? And uh, Dr. Music covered this very well, and I hope that you all appreciated one of his messages, which is that we can't do it, uh, we don't have the capacity or resources to do it all right now ourselves. We need help. So specialty practices do not have the capacity for the potentially, you know, upwards of a million or more people in this country who could benefit from these kinds of treatments. Um, and so uh, it's fine to say, you know, recommend that, oh, only specialists should do this. Well, okay. But if only specialists do this, what you're saying is the majority of people will not get benefit. They will not get treated. So we have to, we have to understand what the implications of our recommendations are. And it's going to require the medical system, just as we have with every other advancement, primary care physicians screen for cholesterol and blood pressure and control many diseases, diabetes and other diseases. Alzheimer's, I predict, will be no different. We will have to learn how to manage and start the management process in the primary care settings um, to help. It's, it's such a common disease. We have to have that as part of the solution. And, um, and how that gets worked out and what the best ways of doing that are need to be sorted out and implemented. And I think that's going to happen at multiple fronts, but one of those fronts is likely to be at the federal level through the agencies of deciding how do the communities, the national, the state, the local communities, how do they have their medical systems built so that they're part of the solution, these primary care settings? And, and importantly, how do we include everybody as part of the solution. When we go to answer these questions, we need to do a broader job of what we've been doing in clinical trials. The very first trial where we're just trying to answer, does the drug help, needs to be better answered across, does it help in the broader population? And as we move to implementing this in the medical settings, in the medical communities, and in primary care settings, I think we can do this. We can have the majority of people who could benefit from these kind of treatments involved in that process of figuring out um, how to do this and, and how to implement it optimally. And then finally, how are we going to coordinate and cover the whole process of how do we test for Alzheimer's? How do we screen for it? What about the diagnostic testing, CSF, PET scans, blood tests? What kinds of infrastructure are going to be needed? Dr. Music covered at right now, this is version 1.0. We This is our first build of how we're doing this. This is going to evolve. It's going to change. It's going to become more streamlined and more efficient as things grow. Um, and, and actually, I'll, I'll just make a point here. We handle very complex treatments uh, that are very difficult and dangerous to implement in a common disease today very well, and that's cancer. There is no reason in the world we can't do this for Alzheimer's disease. It's easier. These treatments are less toxic, have less side effects than the majority of cancer treatments. And uh, I think we can implement changes. And the, uh, the effect sizes we're having on our patients are arguably just as large, if not larger, than many of the treatments that are being implemented today. So, so I think we can do this, and it's going to be a matter of, of how that we proceed forward. Um, and then how do we account for this time window and impl implementation? I want to be very specific here because I, I do think this is an important issue for the people here today and for all of us that are thinking about implementing treatments is that for every day that we delay doing something, whether it's research discovery of a new treatment, a new test, a new implement, or the implementation part of this, or how do we deliver it to people, there are people who are moving out of a window of benefit. There's a window of opportunity to benefit. And as people move outside that window, 
the data is indicating they don't benefit. So we are on the clock here. It is a it is a time crunch situation, and there are people who can benefit. But if the implementation and the delivery is too slow, it will have an impact on people's lives. Okay. Next slide. So how do we estimate? How do we know what are measures? What do we judge these questions by? If we're looking for uh, questions about how long do we treat, what dose, who do we treat, how do we treat them, what's our outcome measure, what do we and others really care about? And so one measure might be the years to disability. That if we're treating people in an early stage of a disease when they're not disabled, how much time does that give them before they're disabled? Does it give them six months, a year, multiple years? Does that give them time where they can spend time at home with their families and friends and not have to go to nursing home care or get full-time support? So there's going to be, we need to begin to think about and formalize what are our outcome measures? What do patients and their families and society, what do we care about? And how should we be, what are our metrics in terms of answering these questions? What is the relative magnitude of benefit of treating at different stages of disease? If at one stage of disease you have a 45 or 50 percent effect size, and in another stage of disease you only have a 25 or 30 percent, and another stage of disease you only have a 5 or 10 percent, what does that mean? And ultimately, there's a there's a question, there's a hypothesis that we're trying to answer, which is what about the potential benefit of treating people before they have symptoms? So the ongoing prevention trials are aiming to help answer this question. And is there a way to actually delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease in people? And then what metrics there matter and how are we going to answer those questions? That's coming, by the way. I think in the next few years, we're going to be having signals. I mentioned one of the signals in our IN2 trials of mutation carriers, uh, maybe one of the first signals in prevention, but there are other trials that are continuing forward that will be having information that will be coming out about this about the potential to try to prevent the disease. And then finally, uh, what percent of eligible patients benefit under different diagnostic and treatment models? And so however we build this, however we implement it, we'll have to think about this broader question of, well, how many people are we reaching? Are we reaching most people? Are we reaching everyone? Are we reaching less than half or less than a quarter of the people? And uh, those will be important factors. Okay, next slide. Uh, future directions. Um, I mentioned uh, the prevention trials. That's the first point there. There's two sporadic AD prevention trials ahead in Trailblazer 3 that are using these anti-amyloid drugs to try to answer those questions. There's another approach being tried, and this was uh, mentioned by Dr. Hodes. It's combination treatment. So now that we know what benefit uh, amyloid drug has in a certain setting, can we now add to that? And in our trials, for example, we're using an anti-tau antibody in combination, and uh, that's uh, an approach that I think will, will be tried also in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But can we combine different anti-amyloid drugs and have additive or even synergistic benefits? These are questions that we still have to, to figure out. And an exciting one that, that we've, I've heard about for at least 15 years, but I think we are now in arm's reach of it, is this concept of personalized medicine approaches to detect the, the disease in individuals and for that individual to decide what to do based on their measures. And it might be biomarkers, it might be other things. But for example, uh, there's now scientific evidence building that we can predict not just who will get Alzheimer's disease, but about when they will get it. And so if we can tell someone that they're, five, 10, or 20 years away from the onset of their dementia, we might be able to use that for a personalized plan for what that means for that individual and what we should do about it based on a variety of things, their own personal background, their, their comorbidities, their life expectancy, what's happening, things of that nature. So I think that's on the horizon of, of what might be coming. Okay, and I think that, uh, yep, that's my last slide. I'll stop there. I think we have, uh, do we have a little time for questions before we break? Okay. So we'll open it up for questions.
Jerry. Yeah, thank, thank you for the terrific presentation, uh, Dr. Bateman, Dr. Music. Um, I think what you really bring forward is not just the science of it all, but the ability to answer scientific questions within the context of a community of practice, if you will. And I think you've also, in, in trying to delineate what this is like, um, have gotten a glimpse into what I think it might feel like for our beneficiaries to try to seek care. Care is hard. The system is really, we, we collectively need to improve the system. I will also say, I think there is a huge leap of faith that happens between enrolling in a clinical trial. Let's pretend you actually get there to enroll. How do you actually get there to enroll and to be able to improve the efficiency there, right? So it would be good to know what the impediments might be <clears throat> that make it difficult to identify who might benefit when and from what. Um, I think there's general interest, and we've talked about this over the years, and you know, what might be some core metrics or core outcomes that could be shared across different studies. But if we were to even broaden that aperture, <clears throat> aperture a little bit more, what are the outcomes that really matter to people living with the disease and the people who care for them? So it has real clinical implications too. And I think, you know, using the infrastructure that we've been working on over time, um, with EHRs, with data standardization, I think those are all tremendous opportunities. So, you know, I think that is one reflection. And, and thank you for also saying that you are utilizing the CMS registry. It is one of several CED approved um, studies, if you will. And, you know, we, we also have, um, we're so delighted that you know we have representation with a CED study in the Northeast and also in Atlanta. Um, I think the question then becomes in Atlanta. I was thinking of the CED Emory Care you know, Memory Network. Uh, I think you know how do we synergize to be sure that we're in those localities. We're making good use of the resources that our federal partners are standing up and making available. So I guess that's one question to you, just knowing some of the resources in the Washington University area, what more can be done and supported for the people who receive care or who need that care? Um, it may have nothing to do with a therapeutic, but they still need the care. So thank you yep. so much, over. Uh, I'm going to take a first shot at that, uh, and in a self-confessed, uh, you know, my experience here is clinical from the clinic, and this is not an area of my my focused research. And, and there are others who can speak more to some of those questions, Sherry. But I, I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, in St. Louis, we uh, our system has a catchment area of the the region, and it's and it's a large part of the Midwest, spanning a few states, largely Missouri and Illinois. Uh, including a lot of rural areas. And we have uh, a, a wide diversity of uh, patient population in our specialty clinic, but it's not as diverse as uh, some of the primary care practice areas. And I, 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 I've been the, the issues in a few areas. One is awareness. I think one of the greatest challenges to benefit uh, to receiving um, appropriate diagnosis, care, and support uh, is awareness of the resources, of what is possible. And this, I think, is exacerbated uh, by people who are not as connected, either from education levels, financial levels, uh, locality, or, or proximity, or other factors. There are many factors that I think feed into that. But to me, the, one of the, one of the, the big barriers, it's the invisible one, is they're just not aware. 
that things are out there that they could utilize. The second is access. Uh, it can be difficult to impossible for some populations to receive access at specialty centers. And again, the, the same factors that affect awareness also affect access. Even if you're aware of it, you don't have the right insurance, you may not be part of a system that can get into a specialty clinic. If you are physically too far away and you are not capable of driving the five to six hours to a specialty center, you're not going to get a PET scan. Okay. Um, so, so those are the two big things that, that influence it. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of us think that uh, it's important that we engage the entire medical community, including the primary care systems, in doing this. Um, the other opportunity I want to highlight, though, is something that I think CMS has already started looking to do and is already taking action on, which is uh, how do you how do you affect within the 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 payer model within the system that has to cover the the the, the services? How do you affect better care? Now, how do you build it in a way so that the system itself, the model that, that that's employed, incentivizes better care? And I think there's real opportunity there because it's one of the effector arms that seems to have real influence on behavior. Um, and so, so I think there's real opportunity there for CMS to play a major role in um, delivering better care for, for people in the, in the population. Um, Eric, did you have any thoughts on... Uh, Sherry's question, comments? No, I mean, I, I, a couple very short things. I mean, I think one of the issues is that people like us, Dr. Bateman, myself, you know, our clinics are going to be so involved in the nuts and bolts of just getting people their infusions that it's hard to kind of deal with all these other aspects that are all incredibly important of sort of dealing with, you know, the holistic aspects of, of treatment. So, you know, you can almost envision a scenario I know for diabetes and some other diseases where they have these, you know, nurses or other providers that call the patients and, you know, kind of help them through the process. Like, I think we need something like that where, I mean, we're sort of doing that with our clinic, but we're only able to do that because our clinic is essentially funded, you know, with philanthropy and other things. I don't think that that's really a feasible, you know, I don't think our clinic could just be duplicated in the community very easily from a financial standpoint it wouldn't make any money and would not survive so i do think there's a need for the sort of an expanded view of how you um, manage these patients through this process in a holistic way not necessarily with neurologists but with other care providers that could make sure that they're getting their infusions and they're doing what they need to do uh, you know and addressing other issues like getting them to the appointments and things i mean you know as, as dr bateman said if you live far away it's a huge problem if you don't have somebody that can drive you every two weeks, it's an even bigger problem. I mean, so it can be something as simple as just transportation to a center that's two miles away. So, you know, I, I think that the whole system will have to kind of evolve. Okay, great. Uh, Sherry, I'll let you respond, and then we're going to go to John Richard for his comment or question, and then we're going to need to move on to the, to the next presenter. Yeah, and sorry, Arlene, Arlene, question. Okay, go ahead. So, so just very briefly, so... We, we hear you and understand and just also agree that we have an opportunity to, to think about what does high quality care look like and we have been driving towards that as part of the national, CMS national quality strategy and included in that is better dementia care. So that's number one. In the interim though, also flag for you that there are certain billing codes that are applicable to helping navigate uh, care, uh, people with behavioral health needs. We've defined that broadly, including um, people with uh, who may be at risk of depression or because sometimes you just don't know, right? When you see the, the patients, is it is it reversible? Is, it, is this progressive? We don't know. So we've defined those codes broadly, but they don't have the label for Alzheimer's or for dementia, mm -hmm. but they're built with flexibility and broadness in mind. So I can come up with that list that I think we've shown in uh, previous meetings, but we can, we can circulate that. So thank you, over. 
Okay, uh, John Richard. Yes, uh, Dr. Music, and I'm hoping I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, if I heard you right, you I think you said that um, for those with younger onset or, or younger people um, who aren't eligible for Medicare, that that there are no options for them, or at least less options. Um, I'm wondering what are we looking at to, because uh, I know that uh, you 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 both mentioned that if you can treat it earlier, if you can treat it asymptomatic, well, that that often would include catching it at a much earlier age. So what's being done to help push toward getting the insurance companies to help cover these so that we can bring in that particular um, group of people? Well, I think, you know, what you said is exactly true. I mean, these are the patients that I think Dr. Bateman and I and others want to treat the most, you know, the patients that have early onset and potentially, you know, still have kids in college and things like that. You know, you really want to preserve. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to cast too broad a, a net. I don't know. I, I've, I've heard from our people in our center that some insurance companies have not been willing to pay for this at this point. Now, maybe that will change over time. I don't know what pressure is being applied or sort of what can be done about that, but certainly, you know, there needs to be an awareness that these, and, and I think that it's in general insurance companies, when they see someone that's 55 and they hear Alzheimer's disease, they're skeptical perhaps, or, or they, you know, but there needs to be awareness among these, you know, these insurance companies that that this is a real phenomenon that, you know, these patients need this treatment. It's not some, uh, you know, misdiagnosis or something like that. So I, I don't know how I can't speak to how pressure is applied in that way or education is applied in that way, but certainly that's going to need to happen. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the companies, you know, this is so new, they're still sort of adapting and, and they have some leeway at that, but there's going to come a point where they need to cover these things. So. Okay, thanks. Arlene, you were next. So thanks, you know, for bringing up the role of primary care. The reality is that primary care in this country is on life support. It only, only four to five percent, oh, only four to five percent of um, medical spending goes to primary care. To do this, they need interdisciplinary teams that are not funded. And also, um, you know, even aggressive hypertension control, sometimes they don't have the resources even for that. So I, th I, th I just wanted to make the point that we really need to think about how we could invest and support primary care as the backbone of dementia care in this country. So that's just a comment. But, and then the question I had is because there's such a big co-occurrence of uh, vascular dementia with Alzheimer's, I'm just curious what your approach is in, in your clinic and for people who have that mixed dementia with vascular and Alzheimer's. Okay, uh, uh, I'll fill that real quick and then, then we'll, uh, I think we have one other question on the, on the online uh, system. So for the vascular risk factors uh, in our clinic, we typically treat those pretty aggressively and it's one of the actionable things that we can do for patients. Um, a fair number of times we get people who have hypertension and other risk factors and they're under good control. But there's a surprising number of times that people reach, we are a subspecialty. We're not just a neurologist, we're a, a memory specialist neurologist. So people have seen two to four doctors, levels of doctors before they get to our clinic. And we still have people come in with uncontrolled blood pressure. And so it's, uh, so we take that pretty seriously and aggressively because we know it matters um, and, and we treat that. I think what's important though, is that we continue to understand what is the interaction between those, those diseases and how best to optimally treat them. And I was just delighted to hear that, uh, you know, the NINDS is, has these plans for this um, combined trial with vascular uh, dementia combined with with Alzheimer's disease. So it's those kinds of things that need to be done. And I really appreciate your comment on, about life's uh, primary care being on life support. I had a conversation with my primary doctor about Alzheimer's and that, that I asked him to please participate in an Alzheimer's diagnosis study. And he said, there's no way I, I can't, there's, I'm, I'm, I can't, you know, we're keeping, we're barely keeping the ship afloat as it is. 
And, um, and so I think you're right. I think, I think they're going to have to have some level of support. Okay. Uh, Joanne, I think you're the last person hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you, um, for a great presentation, uh, on where we are with the DMTs. I just wanted to circle back really quickly on John Richard's question on health plans and payers and the role, um, of, reaching out and making sure they are moving forward on coverage on this as well. And we believe strongly at the Alzheimer's Association, this is the responsibility of the advocacy community. And we have been working with health systems, health plans, health payers to educate, move along, build quality measures around implementation and answering questions about how do you get through the diagnostic and treatment process. In fact, we held our first payer summit a couple of weeks ago in DC and Dr. Mims was able to uh, be there with us uh, where we really brought together uh, a cross section of health plans, health payers to really have an in-depth conversation around this. Um, so we're, we are working on it and I know there are several others in this space that are working on it as well. Okay, great. All right, with that, we're going to move on to our next speaker. We're going to forego the break and keep charging ahead. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Head will be covering Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And I, I think as we've mentioned, uh, and for those of you who don't know, Down syndrome, people almost all universally are, are at risk or get Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there is an enormous amount that we don't know currently about treatments. Uh, and over the past several NAPA meetings, well, in fact, for years, I've heard calls for having Down syndrome represented in trials and understanding how that population might do with treatments. And that uh, the, those calls, I think, have been um, increasing, especially now that treatments are, are there in the clinic for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So we think this is a critically important topic, and we wanted to uh, hear what the latest advances were in the setting of uh, uh, for Down syndrome people, and so that we can uh, use that information to move forward. Elizabeth? Great. Thanks, Dr. Bateman, for the invite, and uh, I'm delighted to talk about my favorite topic in the world, which is um, um, working with people, older people with Down syndrome as they potentially develop Alzheimer's disease. And I'll wait for that slide to come up. But I can go ahead and start. The first slide will be disclosures. Um, nothing surprising to you all. There you go. Thanks. Great. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just a, a short list of disclosures, um, much smaller than Dr. Bateman's. So let me just put everything, all of us on the same page and talk about why we're so interested in helping people with Down syndrome and why are they at such high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Down syndrome is uh, caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21 or trisomy 21, which is the most common cause of Down syndrome. And of course, on that gene, uh, on that chromosome is the amyloid precursor protein gene. So that means people with Down syndrome, even in utero, are making too much APP and they're making too much beta amyloid. And this leads to a very early age of onset of beta amyloid accumulation, which we see first intracellularly and then later develops into extracellular beta amyloid plaques. Uh, one of the really helpful and unique features of, of people with Down syndrome is this beta amyloid accumulation is highly age dependent. And I'll circle back on this because this gives us an opportunity, potential for prevention studies. Next click. So um, as Dr. Bateman mentioned, that means that really uh, people with Down syndrome by the time they're 40 years of age have sufficient pathology for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So in around the 30s, the beta amyloid plaques start to develop but by age 40, the tangles have come on. And it turns out the gap between plaques and tangles is extremely short in people with Down syndrome. We're estimating between two and a half to five years. Um, but everybody with Down syndrome with full trisomy has AD pathology in their brains. Uh, it is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. And one could make the argument it's the most common genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, given that there's over 400,000 people in the United States alone who have Down syndrome. Next slide. 
So some good news are is that people with Down syndrome are living longer, and we think this is partly due to improvements in medical care and managing co-occurring illnesses, but it's also a lot to do with social integration and access. Um, so this is the really good news. However, it isn't across the board. We're seeing a lot of racial and ethnic um, differences in terms of lifespan. So the people who are living longer with Down syndrome are typically those people who are white. Um, it does not seem to apply as well to people who are black or other races and ethnicities. And this isn't biology, this is health disparities. What we are learning is the most rapidly growing age cohort is people between 40 and 50 years of age. And as I just mentioned, 40 is kind of the age where we see full-blown AD in the brain. When a person does develop dementia and they have Down syndrome, typically the age of onset is between 50 and 55 years of age. It's really striking when you look at all the cohort studies going on around, on around the world and you combine them together, around 54.8 is the magical number where most of us see people start to convert. However, the bad news is, is that this uh, disease is very aggressive in people with Down syndrome and once they show those clinical signs, their average age of death may be before 60. And the disease duration is also very quick, as I mentioned, 4.6 years on average. But there's some really interesting and exciting um, information that we're learning from our longitudinal aging cohort studies is we're now starting to see some people living into their 60s and even early 70s with Down syndrome who don't seem to be showing signs of cognitive decline. So this is going to give us some incredible opportunities to understand um, resilience. Next slide, please. Now, AD, of course, um, does limit the life expectancy for people with Down syndrome. And this beautiful work by McCarran et al. in 2017, which was then built into a meta-analysis by Juan Fortilla's group in Barcelona, Spain, suggests essentially that AD is the primary reason why people with Down syndrome die. So for this population of people, we really, really, really need a treatment. It's, it's becoming incredibly urgent for us. Next slide, please. So there are a number of challenges when we think about developing disease-modifying treatments for people with Down syndrome um, to either treat the disease or potentially prevent it. And that is, and this is a, a, a quotation from a paper published in 2015, which still applies essentially now, is that there is very low quality um, of, of evidence in multiple clinical trials for people with Down syndrome that really show any demonstrated proof that these interventions are of benefit to people with Down syndrome. So, for example, of all of our commonly used um, Alzheimer's disease drugs that are available typically don't work very well in people with Down syndrome. Uh, and they're typically also associated with some more adverse events than what we would expect in the neurotypical population. And one of the reasons for this problem is the very small sample sizes of people enrolled in clinical trials with Down syndrome. However, these drugs are commonly prescribed for people with Down syndrome. And now we know, as everybody knows, and it was mentioned earlier by Dr. Bateman, and Dr., uh, was that people with Down syndrome are, are excluded from clinical trials for people with Alzheimer's disease. And this is where this real grassroots movement has, has evolved in the, in the Down syndrome community of we really want people with Down syndrome access to these clinical trials as well. Next, click. Now there's some opportunities we can think about. Click one more time. And that is that um, there are a, a number of really beautiful lifespan studies that are going on now and, and looking at aging across the lifespan for people with Down syndrome is going to be incredibly helpful for understanding the progression of events and what the earliest signs of evolution into Alzheimer's disease is. And as I mentioned previously, age is one of the biggest risk factors and we can really map progression as a function of age uh, on the X axis. Next click. And as I mentioned, we have an opportunity now maybe to start looking at resilience. We have enough people around the world enrolled in these longitudinal aging studies in our, our own study that I'll talk about briefly to, uh, to understand what are the um, protective factors for people with Down syndrome against this huge amount of AD pathology in their brains. How on earth is it that their brains buffer all of this um, neurodegeneration? Is it related to chromosome 21? Can we get some hints from chromosome 21? Or is it completely independent of that and it's related to lifestyle, for example? Next slide. And I think as time goes by with more and more people taking medicines to, that are used to treat Alzheimer's in the general population uh, with in 
all this patient and participant tracking, uh, we'll be able to kind of go and look at medical health care records, for example, and find out how many people are taking these medicines and what's the impact of that on their, on their clinical science. And last, I would argue, and I'm, I'm really glad to see, that now people with Down syndrome are being included or added on to studies as, an, as a separate cohort. And I think that's really the ideal way to go. It is really challenging to bring people with Down syndrome into an ongoing clinical trial focused on people with Alzheimer's disease because of the outcome measures are going to be substantially different. Next slide. So are we ready for clinical trials? And I think if you surveyed all of us in the field of Down syndrome who have been studying um, the aging process, we all agree we, we are ready. We are ready for this. And there's been an absolutely exponential rise in the amount of data coming out of all these longitudinal studies. And a lot of these cohort studies, we all collaborate extensively to leverage each other's cohorts because of our sample sizes. So the one that I'm most involved with is the Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium for Down Syndrome. And this is led by Ben Handen, Brad Christian, Mark Mapstone, and I. And it's a study intended to recruit people with Down syndrome over 25 years and older and follow them every 16 months and map all of these various biomarkers, which I'll show you in a second. So we really want to understand what are the biological changes that underlie AD pathology and driving AD pathology in people with Down syndrome? What are those biomarkers that help us diagnose and maybe predict the age of onset? that could be used for screening and for future clinical trials. And this importantly includes what are the neuropsychological and clinical outcome measures we should be using because this is a group of people with intellectual disability and so we have a different background against which we need to work. And we've also in looking ahead are in co-enrolling people in ABCDS in the ACTC trial ready cohort for Down syndrome led by Mike Raffi so that everybody uh, that's in ABCDS is co-enrolled in the trial-ready cohort and their data are available for immediate screening and inclusion into clinical trials. It's a wonderful group of people, including 92 people across the country and 19 institutions. And we always value the, the wonderful insights and guidance from the NIH, including Lori Ryan, Melissa Parisi, Erica Tarver, and John Chow. Next slide, please. So very briefly, and, and I'm kind of glad I kept this slide in because Dr. Bateman and Dr. Musick mentioned precision medicine and personalized medicine as one thing that we should think about in the future. And ABCDS, the structure of ABCDS is intended to kind of capture that potential in the future. So I'll just highlight that we, you know, just as with many Alzheimer's centers across the country and other beautiful longitudinal studies, we have multiple cores, all centered around different biomarkers. So neuroimaging, which includes MR and PET, we have an omics core that's looking at proteomics, metabolomics. Uh, we also uh, conduct brain donations or accept brain donations. And we have uh, all of our data are immediately available for free to everybody in the community. It's a uniting structure. But overlaying that are three major projects. And, and that is to really understand the progression of these different biomarkers as a function of age in people with Down syndrome try and understand what additional genetic contributions might shift those curves left or right, protective or enhance risk. But importantly in project three, led by Sid O'Brien and Mark Mapstone, the biomarkers for Down syndrome clinical trials is essentially a precision medicine approach. How can we build models that help us predict who's going to convert? Next slide, please. And I'm not gonna read all this, but I want you just to skim to get an idea of the, the depth of phenotyping we're doing with these wonderful people, understanding all of the um, neuroimaging outcome measures, all the fluid bi outcome measures. We do include CSF, um, actually that is run at, at WashU, uh, but we don't get a lot of people with Down syndrome are willing to undergo that procedure. And we are uh, accelerating on our brain donation program as our cohort gets older. Next slide. So there's a number of, I think, challenges and opportunities that we can think about just for the current year with respect to the goals and, and the vision of NAPA. We do know, and it, it, it's already happening, that people with Down syndrome are gonna be asking for access to these treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And families are arguing very strongly that people with Down syndrome should have access. We know that also this year, there's gonna be a number of clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease and people with Down syndrome that are going to begin, which means a lot of our longitudinal lifespan studies are gonna to have to pause for a subset of people and we hope we can bring them back afterwards. We want to be inclusive, 
and offer clinical trials to people in ABCDS. And again, um, how can we do that? Because we want them, they're our number ones, we want them to have access. And then how do we, uh, as I mentioned, keep them back in our longitudinal research program. But I do think ABCDS, as, as well as another, all these other longitudinal cohort studies can provide some really nice insights in how to best design clinical trials for people with Down syndrome and provide some context for what are the possible adverse events we might expect? Would we expect to see more or less of those? And how do we balance the messaging to family and to investigators? We want clinical trials for people with Down syndrome, but we also have some concerns about the possible side effects. And I'm going to give you an example of that on the next slide. So there was some beautiful discussion by Dr. Music and Dr. Bateman about how to implement immunotherapy in the clinical setting. Of course, we're not even close with people with Down syndrome, but families know these drugs are available and they want access. So um, I won't go through the first two points because we've heard some beautiful information about um, the benefits of immunotherapy and also potentially the significant adverse events, depending on your APOE genotype, for example, of ARIA. And so one of the concerns that we have, and certainly I have through some of the data we've been collecting in ABCDS and looking at brain at autopsies, is that people with Down syndrome have significant cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So in this picture, there's a, um, an image of beta amyloid 1 to 42 immunostaining in the brain of a person with Down syndrome. You can see those big brown plaques, but you can also see those lines. Those are blood vessels that are literally caked with beta amyloid. And on the right panel is a beta 1 to 40 immunostaining, a different fragment of beta amyloid, also really loves these blood vessels. And in the bottom graph, when we look at the percentage of people who have come to autopsy who show cerebral amyloid angiopathy, compare people with Down syndrome to those with late onset Alzheimer's disease and elderly non-demented controls, people with Down syndrome have much more cerebral amyloid angiopathy and it's far more severe. And that's related most likely to this APP overexpression. So we're worried about this. Certainly I'm worried about this, but I, again, I still want to encourage investigators to include this cohort in their studies of immunotherapy. Next slide. So we can leverage a lot of the unique features about brain aging and Alzheimer's disease and people with Down syndrome. And in particular, um, it was already, the, the Jack curve was already mentioned earlier, the ATN framework of which we've been also trying to model all of the pathology that we see in people with Down syndrome and the, and the changes in biomarkers. With that unique feature, and you can see in this image here, the graph, the x-axis is age. So we know exactly what age these different events occur in a person with Down syndrome. And it's very clear in Down syndrome, beta amyloid comes first, tau comes second, the extensive cerebral amyloid angiopathy seems to come on after 50 years of age. Uh, but there's other kind of interesting overlaps in terms of, say, neuroinflammation. We see some features that are very similar in Down syndrome uh, and in people with Alzheimer's disease, but we also see some very unique phenotypes. And actually, Donna Wilcox in the room, and Donna has done some beautiful work in this space for us uh, with Down syndrome. But we have a really wonderful opportunity to identify therapeutic windows. We know what we should target at the age of the person, given the age of the person. Uh, and we can also understand better what are the, the windows of safety when we're thinking about these clinical trials. Immunotherapy, it would make the most sense to target people under 50, for example. But if somebody is 40 years of age with Down syndrome, we maybe need both amyloid and tau immunotherapy at the same time. But if they're in their 20s or early 30s, maybe beta amyloid immunotherapy is the only target we need to think about. But we don't know how inflammation, for example, relates to all of this and other markers of cerebrovascular pathology. Next slide. So I think by working with people with Down syndrome, uh, we can really contribute a lot of really wonderful understanding to progression of Alzheimer's disease, not only for people with Down syndrome, but for the neurotypical population. And this can happen by leveraging all of these prospective uh, longitudinal studies that are ongoing, including ABCDS. Um, and we've really benefited from uh, in the INCLUDE program funding, which allows us to get a little more, uh, a little bigger bolus of funds to continue this work. Uh, using age in these jack curves um, on the x-axis really also helps us understand the progression of events and the different treatment targets based on age. 
we can identify these efficacious windows and also windows of safety. But we can also start looking at the impact of different risk factors and how they shift that curve around, including the genetics of Down syndrome. Not only is chromosome 21 affected, but other chromosomes uh, show gene differences because of this dose effect of, of chromosome 21. And the whole story about resilience and people, by studying people with Down syndrome, we might get some really interesting insights. And this is a, an area that's really just started to evolve, I would say, in the last year. So stay tuned because uh, the Down syndrome teams are participating with the resilience and cognitive reserve teams in the, in the Alzheimer's Association PIAs. And so I anticipate some exciting outcomes. So my last slide is a thank you slide. Of course, uh, we can't do any of this work without our research volunteers, their families, and really appreciate those folks who underwent brain donation. And I put a list of all the key people involved with our different cores and projects that you can skim your eye over. Again, it takes a village to make this work happen. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Head. We, we appreciate the uh, comprehensive and but still somehow amazingly clear uh, presentation of a complex topic. Uh, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, I see uh, we, we have a couple here in the room. Uh, I'll start. Um, so a question, in terms of experience for Down syndrome and treatments, is there a way to leverage the existing um, registries that we're using, for example, in uh, CMS and drug administration? Is there a way to use those or, or some other registry to track in real world? I imagine that there are probably some people with Down syndrome who are already uh, starting treatment. And if so, can we track those folks? Uh, even a small number of people could potentially tell us a lot about things like ARIA rate. I noted that the neuropathology uh, in sporadic AD for moderate or severe CAA was a little over 25%, which is a typical ARIA rate for some of the drugs. Right. But it was double that in Down syndrome. So the so one hypothesis that I'm sure folks have is, is the ARIA rate going to be double in Down syndrome? And how can we get that information as quickly as possible? I would expect the ARIA rate would be higher, but also our, our, our participants would screen out on a majority of these measures because they do have a lot of microhemorrhages to begin with. I, there must be a way to track this. I would love to hear um, more from people who are familiar with those registries and data sets because um, anything we can learn, like you said, Randy, one person gives us a huge amount of information in this context. There is a, um, a different online kind of registry, Down Syndrome Connect, that Melissa Parisi headed up that families voluntarily register and provide basic health information about uh, their loved one with Down Syndrome. That might be a vehicle also to do a grassroots effort of getting people to consider providing that information. But I think it's, it must be feasible. Most people are on Medicare or Medicaid with Down Syndrome, so that information must be there. Mm. So if they are covered, then there, there must be some way to track if they're receiving the medication, whether it's being paid for by the payers or not. Right. Uh, but certainly even in the a medical record system, there's probably some way to track whether uh, they have occurrences of ARIA um, in that, you know, there are going to be certain diagnostic codes that are used for that uh, as we respond to those MRI changes and, and clinical changes to respond to. So it would be an interesting idea, just the real world Mm -hmm. um, experience, experience to mm -hmm. capture that. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other questions in the room? Great. Yeah. No. And uh, none online. Okay. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.